Well, good morning. Welcome to another session of Crop Hour, uh, sponsored by SDSU Extension. I'm glad to have you this morning on this uh, blizzardy day. Um, good day to stay home and and sit in front of your computer and learn about uh, soil health and regenerative ag. And today we have Lance Gunderson of Regen Ag Labs. Lance is the president and co-owner of the lab located in Pleasanton, Nebraska. Lance is an expert in soil health testing, having well over 10 years of experience with Haney and PFLA. And so today, uh, Lance is going to talk to us about um, regenerative ag and microbial uh, issues in the soil. And uh, we're happy to have him and we'll get his PowerPoint up and going right now. So Lance, uh, um, oh, and I'd like to say about questions, please. Please ask questions in the Q&A or the chat. I'll try to monitor that. And if appropriate, I'll, I'll interrupt uh, Lance and, and we'll ask that question or I'll decide to hold it to the end. So Lance, uh, you're on. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Anthony, can you confirm you can see that and hear me? Yes, I can see uh, your presentation. It's in the correct mode right. and we can hear you well. Okay, very good. Uh, never know. Sometimes you get five minutes into these things before you figure out no one can hear you. So uh, yeah, thank you again, uh, Anthony and Sarah, for having this and, and asking me to be a part of it. Um, yeah, this is a this is a great opportunity. And, and uh, snowing where you are, I'm in Tulsa today. Uh, it is raining here, but a little warmer, so uh, no snow. But um, Anyway, I'm going to I'm going to go through this and and uh, as Anthony mentioned webinars are a little different because I can't see anybody so I don't know if you're sleeping crying cheering um, or if you have dying burning questions, um, but please feel free to put those in the Q and a and uh, we'll get started. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to touch on some microbial things I mean there's a lot of different directions I can go. Uh, but I, I really, the, some of the biggest questions I get regarding testing is, okay, how do I, how do I use this information? Um, you know, whether it's any tests or PLFA or even, you know, even conventional soil tests. I mean, it's amazing that for 50 or 60 years, we've been measuring soil tests and, or soils. And, um, uh, anyway, that we don't really know how to how to do that. Here, I'll start my camera up. Okay, so everybody can see me now. Um, thank you, Sarah. Um, so how do we how do we do this? Well, I'm going to kind of go through a little bit about how we use some of these tests and how we stack them up. But I'm going to kind of try to get you to set a little bit of a different mindset here. So the very first thing I like to show people is, look, this is the team of people at Region Ag Lab. Uh, I get to do these presentations and I get to stand up on stage or behind a camera here and, and do these presentations. And that's fantastic. It's what I love to do, but if it wasn't for this team of people and yeah, there are a few others, uh, that have more recently been added to our team. Uh, but if it wasn't for this group of people and those people, I couldn't do this. Uh, it's these people that are handling your soil samples. They're running the lab. Uh, Jeremy Dolland uh, in the back right hand side there uh, with that that killer mustache. He is the vice president and he is our operations guy. Uh, he's a co-owner of Region Ag Lab and he runs a lab. So I show this to you because I want you to also keep in mind, you know, a lot of operators, uh, farm land managers, you're taking a little bit of a risk, right? Uh, it's hard to do something that not has, you know, not really been done before, right? Obviously that's the big answer, the big thing everyone says, well, we do it this way because this is how we've always done it. Understand that's comfortable. Think about your support team. Uh, and if you don't have a very good one, find one. Uh, start to build that support team because it will really help you uh, during this transition part. One of the members that you don't see on that photo is this guy, uh, our chief soil obsessor. Uh, this is Dr. Rick Haney. Uh, yes, he is the crazy guy in the NASA suit. 
uh, that did not fit into the box. Uh, no offense to anybody with uh, with universities and NRCS and ARS. I'm an equal opportunity picker. Uh, I'll pick on everybody, including us. Um, but we've got Dr. Rick Haney, and uh, I've known this man now for 12 years, 13 years. We hired him a couple of years ago to be our chief scientific officer. Um, obviously, the developer of the Haney test. So we have a lot of support from him as well. Uh, and he's a great person to work with. So that's a little bit about our team. And now I'm gonna kind of step through and, and set a little bit of a mindset of how in the world are we gonna use soil tests? So I always ask this question, it works a lot better with a live audience. You know, what is this a picture of? You know, I think we all know that this is a puzzle, right? But what is that puzzle picture? And anytime you're thinking about putting together a puzzle, there are multiple pieces. And if you really wanna see the picture, we have to have a majority of the pieces. And if you have, you know, obsessive disorder like I do, if one of the pieces is missing, I gotta get rid of the puzzle because it'll drive me nuts. So it's really difficult in the world of soil. Soil is a giant puzzle. And we try to put together various pieces to understand the picture that we're looking at. We need to understand a majority of the picture in order to help with the management side of that soil system. Now, I am not gonna sit here and tell you that we have every single piece. Uh, and I say we, I'm talking soil science, not just the lab. The lab certainly doesn't have every piece. Soil science certainly doesn't have every piece. Uh, in the world of soil microbiology, 10 years ago, we thought we understood about 10% of the soil organisms uh, that existed. After those 10 years, we've made some huge gaining strides in that department. We now believe we understand about 1%. So we've gone backwards. That doesn't mean that we don't know more. We know a lot more but we've just discovered that every time we figure out something, there are 10 things that we don't have any idea about. Now, I'm not trying to discredit any of the things I'm gonna tell you. It's just that we have to understand that this is a giant black box. And the more pieces we do understand and that we can look at, the better picture we can paint. So that is what this is a picture of. Why, I don't know, this was just on Google, but you know, it's a giant ship floating with a blue sky with bluish mountains and a blue water. I mean, the whole thing's blue. But unless you have those pieces, it's difficult to put together that picture. So think of that when I start talking about these soil tests and how we're going to use them. So with that, here is a traditional approach or conventional approach to soil testing, drawn out as kind of a schematic. So a soil sample comes to a laboratory. We are asked to typically analyze for fertility or plant available NPK. Uh, and yes, it can go beyond NPK, sulfur, zinc, iron, manganese, et cetera. But we're gonna look at the fertility of the soil. We're gonna look at the pH of the soil and we're gonna measure the soil organic matter. And we're gonna put those three things together to develop fertility recommendations based on the crop and your yield goal. This is something that there are 10 million soil samples run, give or take a few in this country every year. And a majority of them go through this type of idea. The biggest issue here is that it's, this approach is basically focused almost entirely on soil fertility and plant requirements. We think as land managers, we can bypass the soil biology because we can just put on whatever the crop needs. Right, we just keep, we just manage that and we just put those things on and we can get this result. Most of you are probably shaking your head going, yeah, well, we don't always see that result. You know, the expected is not, uh, or the, the reality is not always the expected. And there's a lot of factors that go into that. Some we can manage for and kind of control and a lot of them we can't. So, uh, but this is kind of that general layout, and we're going to go through kind of a different approach, uh, but using some of the same tools. So why are we doing a, a different approach? Well, 
I just pulled this off of Google, uh, but I thought it summed things up pretty well. So on the left-hand side, we've got reaching for yield. Now, in this context, they're not necessarily talking about yield uh, in a crop, but uh, it, it works pretty well. Talking about yield in, in business economics. Uh, so this, of course, is stacking all of your, your assets into, into one pile, right, and going for yield. Uh, it's a pretty unstable approach. And then you have the other side, which is diversified return stacking. So I always tell people I got into the wrong line of work. Uh, I probably should have been a money manager because I can't think of any easier job other than being a weatherman to say, you know, where you can be wrong 90% of the time and still be the best in your field. Um, but money management, buy low, sell high, diversify, pretty simple. Uh, the idea here is that if we're going to put all of our eggs in one basket and constantly reach for yield, that works if you have fixed costs and you can control the variables that influence yield. A lot of those variables I mentioned we can't, weather being the big one, right? So the diversified return stacking idea, and I'm going to apply this to soil testing, is instead of putting all your eggs in the NPK basket and just managing fertilizer, how can we start to understand where we have nutrients in all of these different areas? And then how do we pull that all together into a diversified return approach? And we're still gonna be making investments, by the way, uh, in inputs in a lot of cases, but we really wanna know what we're paying for and why. And I promise I'm gonna, this is not an Econ 101 class. Uh, I will get into the testing, but here's the other thing I wanna show you. Supply chain diagram, okay? Raw materials go to a supplier, go to a manufacturer, go to a distributor, retailer, consumer. Most of us in ag probably consider us done at the supply part. As farmers and producers, we're going to produce raw materials. And so you are the supplier to the manufacturer. And then from there on, it goes all the way out to the consumer, right? And in that model, who's getting most of the money? Well, it's the retailer and the distributors and the manufacturers. Um, but I want to look at this a little differently from a soils perspective. So as an ag production supply chain diagram, farmers are actually the consumers. And this is now because the, the supply chain starts over. But if you think about where you're at on your farm, you have raw materials. Those are the nutrients. Who supplies those nutrients? Soil and atmosphere. Who manufactured them? God, Mother Nature, et cetera. Now we think the supplier is the fertilizer salesman. The manufacturer is the company who made that. But in reality, there's no such thing. And I know this is, I'll use this term too, but there's no such thing as synthetic nitrogen. Nitrogen is a naturally occurring element. All the manufacturers do at fertilizer companies is package the nitrogen in a way that can be shipped on the back of a truck and sold to you. They don't create it. It's not something they're actually manufacturing. They're a packaging company. Mother Nature supplied that. Who distributes those nutrients in the system? The microbes do. They control the distribution chains within the soil. The retailer is the plant. And yes, they are a retailer. They purchase nutrients from the microbes in the form of carbon. The plants give up carbon to get nutrients from the plant. It is a trading system if you wanna look at it that way. And you as the farmer are the consumer. You then consume what is coming out of the retailer. Now that process starts over again as soon as you, you supply that to the next step in the chain. But if you think about your soil system in this way, we're gonna evaluate different parts of this chain with different soil tests. And that's what I'm gonna go through right now. 
So that's just trying to set the mindset of how you think about that soil system. So the first test I'm gonna to mention to you is what we call total nutrient digest or TND. This one's relatively new um, in the world of soil. Uh, it, I mean, I say that it's, it's gaining a lot of popularity uh, for different reasons, but uh, it works like a plant tissue analysis. We digest the soil to evaluate soil fertility, but not necessarily plant available. So think of this as measuring your total net worth. So you sit down with a banker or whatever, and you evaluate all of your assets and all of your debts and everything you have, and you figure out what your net worth is. And I'm sure most of you in this discussion today are probably, you know, you've got a net worth around 30 or 40, $50 million, just like everybody, right? But how much of that do you have available? And that's the difference. And so other tests evaluate what you have available. This looks at your total. So this is what a report looks like from Region Ag Lab. Uh, there, there are a few other labs, I think, that run something similar to this, uh, but this is what it looks like. So on the left-hand side, we've got all the nutrients that we're going to analyze for, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, et cetera, et cetera. The results, those are the raw results, the nutrient results, either in percent or parts per million, just depending on how big those numbers are. And then we equate that into pounds per acre, and that's based on depth. Okay, so that's in the middle column. And you'll see here on this example, uh, let me actually step back. So this is a real example. This is a real sample that was pulled uh, here in November last year. Um, and all of these results I'm gonna show you are from the same exact soil. So I'm gonna paint a picture with the exact same sample here. On the right-hand side, we have what's called fertilizer equivalent. This is simply to show you that if you started from zero, so let's look at nitrogen. There are 5,304 pounds of nitrogen in this soil. And this soil is eight inches deep, by the way. So in the top eight inches, we have 5,300 pounds. If you wanted to buy 5,300 pounds of nitrogen and you were gonna buy urea, to get it, you would need 11,530 pounds of urea per acre to get that much nitrogen, okay? This is to show you how different your net worth is in the soil because too many people say to me, I don't have any phosphorus. I don't have any potassium or calcium or nitrogen or whatever. And this is to show you, well, that could be the case, but very likely it's not. And so this is just showing that. If we zoom in here, uh, just to focus in on this, um, a lot of individuals get scared when they see iron numbers. This, the one that's uh, 150,000 pounds, the iron number is huge. Remember your soils are made up primarily of iron, aluminum, and silica. So iron and aluminum are always high. Silica is not part of this test. But if we look at this, we've got the top 100,000 pounds of carbon uh, for a fertilizer equivalent. You know, think about that when you're talking about putting on products to uh, build carbon. Two quarts to the acre is not going to change your uh, carbon number a lot. So, um, but anyway, that's a list of everything that's on here. Again, this is your net worth. And so you say, well, how do I use this? Well, first of all, when you're buying fertilizer, you're buying gap insurance, okay? Fertilizer is gap insurance. It's, think of it as financing. I wanna buy a car. The car costs $50,000. You go to the bank and they say, well, how much money is that, how much of that 50,000 do you need to borrow? Well, it's based on how much money you have available to put towards a car. And so, you're looking at gap insurance or gap financing to get the rest of what you need. And when you say, I'm gonna grow corn and I wanna produce you know, 200 bushel corn, I need this much nitrogen, this much phosphorus, this much sulfur, et cetera. And you need to know what the gap is. The issue is, is that 
soil tests by and large don't do a very good job at evaluating the true gap. That would be like the banker saying, reach into your front pocket, see how much money you have in your pocket. You pull out a $5 bill and they say, well, you need to finance $49,995 to get this car. And you say, well, I have money in other places, right? We need to know where that is and, and if it's gonna be available. The other way that we use this is that we're often told that if we don't put phosphorus on in one year or whatever, or we don't put potassium on, that we're just mining the soil out. Now, given enough time, that's a true statement. Um, you know, we, we have in the past and we can mine soils out. However, we've gone a little bit too far, in my opinion, the other direction. And we've kind of created this fear tactic that if you don't put it on, you don't have it. And if you don't have it, you're gonna have a disaster. And it's kind of like, uh, I don't know, guys, like there's a lot out here that we can utilize if we get the system working properly. So evaluating that, that foundational piece with a test like this, um, this is not something that, that I recommend running every year. This is like once every three, maybe every five years, depending on management plan. You're just tracking some of this over time. Uh, especially looking at the micronutrients down below, boron, molybdenum, copper, because if we're going to mine the soil out, those are the ones that we're going to see first. Uh, it'll take a long time to mine out 2,300 pounds of carbon and or, uh, phosphorus. And keep in mind, this is the top eight inches. Uh, we've run these to four feet before, and you'll see phosphorus numbers at 25, 30,000 pounds. Um, so, and hopefully your plant roots aren't limited to eight inches. So how do we evaluate then what's available? Uh, again, we, this is looking at total, but now we need to know, well, that's great. I'm, I'm worth $10 million, but my, I have $0 in my bank account that I can actually use to buy groceries. That can be a problem. So we need to know what is available. The Haney test is what we use for that portion. Um, and I know we could we could argue all day long or discuss all day long, you know, why the Haney test? Why not just use a traditional test? Why not, you know, why can't we use Malik 3 or Olsen or Bray or ammonium acetate? Well, we, we can, but the chemistry that's used for those tests is not really lining up with what your soil chemistry is in real life. Uh, the Haney test uses a different approach to that. And number two, the Haney test is going to evaluate other nutrients in the system rather than just nitrate. For example, uh, nitrate is just one of many, many compounds in the soil that contain nitrogen. And again, if we want to do gap insurance or fertilizer's gap insurance, we want to know what the true gap is. If fertilizer was free, uh, just like financing money from the bank, if, if they were just going to hand it to you and say zero interest and pay us back whenever, or, you know, no big deal. Well, yeah, then I would, I would own six Maseratis, I, I suppose. Um, but I don't. And because I don't want to pay for them. So fertilizer, of course, is the hot topic. And it's not my approach here is not because I'm against fertilizer. I'm not at all. I just don't want to see people spending a ton of money on fertilizer they don't necessarily need. So if we take this schematic approach, how are we going to build recommendations from this? Well, you'll notice at the very top, we still have soil NPK. We're still going to be looking at fertility. We're going to also look at organic nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, and I'm not using the term organic, uh, meaning organic certified or anything like that. It is literally just meaning nitrogen and phosphorus tied to carbon. We're going to look at microbial biomass. Microbes, uh, microbes are your workforce. They are the ones uh, doing the job. They're the distributors again. Um, and we need to know if those distributors are being paid and they get paid in carbon. Uh, and that is your water extractable carbon. That's the that's the liquid the liquid cash, if you will, flowing back and forth to feed feed the workforce. 
Uh, and then we also need to know what the balance is of that carbon and nitrogen that the microbes are getting. Um, think of nitrogen in this case, organic nitrogen as the benefits package. So, you know, you can have a really big salary and, and make a lot of money, but you got to go buy your own insurance and you got to, you know, you don't get vacation days and all those things. So the nitrogen part is, is the balance of salary and benefits in this case. There's a lot of numbers on this report and I don't want to dwell on this giant page. I'm gonna break it out into pieces, but I just wanted to show you, this is what this report looks like. And I'm gonna go ahead and break this down into different sections, okay? And we'll go through it a little bit and how we use it. So the first thing I'm gonna break out is these two sections. We call the first section other soil measures, and then we have the soil health section. Okay, the other soil measures, pH, buffer pH, soluble salts, excess lime, and organic matter. There is nothing fancy or nothing different on the Haney test compared to any other conventional soil test to run those things. Uh, it's not a new method. It's not a trick. It's nothing. It's, it's a one-to-one -one soil water pH. Uh, we run a modified Woodruff buffer, uh, but you can run Sikora. You can run... Um, any of those others that are out there, soluble salts or electrical conductivity, uh, same one-to-one -one water soil pH uh, method uh, we run EC on. Excess lime, uh, looking at calcium carbonate in the soil. And then soil organic matter, uh, and it's called percent LOI or percent loss on ignition. And that is the standard method that, that basically every lab runs anymore for, for um, soil organic matter. So nothing different on those pieces. Those are direct. You can look at them. You can look at those and compare them to uh, samples run for conventional tests. They, they should be very similar. Uh, soil health. So on the soil health section, we've got, uh, starting on the left-hand side, we've got soil respiration. This is a measure of your microbial activity or, or biomass and potential for activity. Uh, your soils are alive and they breathe. And the more they breathe, the more microbes are in those soils and the more active they can be. Now, again, if you run a company or running your farm, it's probably important, unless you're like the guy I used to work for, um, you know, where we just worked 80 hours every, every day, 80 hours a day, right? <laughs> But it's important to know who your workforce is. You know, you have a job to manage, a farm to manage, and you're saying, okay, who's going to help and what are they going to do? Okay, so this tells you who is there, who's showing up to work. Okay, the water soluble or the water extract is the next section. And the first one there is organic carbon. Okay, this is how much, you, how much cash or how much carbon you have available to pay the microbes. The percent MAC number is the important one. So everyone asks me, well, what should my respiration be? Or how, what number should my organic carbon number be? And that's like me asking you, well, how much money should I have every month? You know, what should I earn and how, what should I spend? Well, how much you spend should be relative to how much you earn. So percent MAC is showing you that relationship. What this number is showing you right here, 63.8, it's saying that 63.8% of the carbon available is being used by the microbes. Ideally, we want this number between 50 and 80% most of the time. If the number stays above 100%, and it can be above 100%, I know that sounds weird, um, but if it stays above hundred percent, what it tells me is that the microbes are eating carbon faster than we can supply it. Now, if that happens to you and I in real life, if I spend money in any given month faster than I earn it, I either go broke or I have to dip into a savings account. The savings account in the soil is the organic matter. 
We don't want the microbes consuming all the organic matter. We don't want them to burn out the savings account because there's only three things that I've found so far that every producer tends to agree on. The commodity price should be better. The weather stinks. And I don't want to lose soil organic matter. Matter of fact, most people say I want to build it. Uh, so we got to be mindful of that. If the percent MAC number is less than 50%, it tells me that my microbes are not limited by food. They might be limited by something else. pH being a big one. Soluble salts. Uh, for anybody using manure and gypsum, uh, I've seen organic matters at 7%. I've seen organic carbon numbers at 500, 600, and I've seen respirations in the single digits be on those same soils because the soluble salts are so high, for example, um, too much gypsum maybe or something like that. So that's how we put these things together. The next piece is the carbon to nitrogen ratio. Now, this is organic carbon to organic nitrogen. It's the balance then again of the food versus, or the energy versus protein. So for anybody who's familiar with livestock or for anybody who's raising their own livestock, two-legged livestock children, um, you'll hear doctors say, you know, don't feed your kids Coca-Cola and Pixie sticks because it's all energy and no nutrition, right? Call them empty calories. That's carbon, that's sugar. Uh, there's no nutrition tied to it at all. At the same time, you can't feed your children Flintstone vitamins and call it a day because that's all nutrition. Um, we could argue whether that's nutrition, but it's all nutrition and no energy. So we're just ration balancing this. Uh, same thing when you're feeding livestock, uh, four-legged livestock, same idea. You're balancing a ration. So Ideally, we want this ratio between 10, then this ratio reads 10.94 to one, okay? It's the, the two one part is, is always there. Um, so it's, it's 11 carbons and one nitrogen in this ratio. Ideally, we want this between 10 to one and 12 to one. It's not concerning if it's between eight and 15. So eight to one and 15 to one, we're still okay, ideally between 10 and 12, but we start to run into issues when we get below eight or above 15. And we'll talk about what those are uh, in a little bit. So then we have the soil health calculation. Yes, I know there's a lot of acronyms, but when you try to shove 70 numbers onto one page, you gotta get creative. So soil health calculation, this is actually probably the least important number on the Haney test, even though it's the one everyone wants to look at. It is a summary of about six different numbers on the Haney test. Anything above seven is on the right track. If we get it above 10, we're really doing okay. Again, how high should this number be? That's relative to your soil type and relative to your geography, okay? Everyone likes to, you know, we've all heard of Gabe Brown. Everyone thinks Gabe Brown has the highest soil health scores in the country. I don't know. I hear that a lot. His soil health scores are 26, 28. Uh, I have run soils in Pennsylvania as high as 48 uh, on a soil health calculation. Um, but Bismarck is a cold, dry place. And no matter how well you manage a soil, it's going to be cold and relatively dry. So there are limitations. Uh, based on these numbers, we give you a cover crop suggestion. And it's a very broad general suggestion. And it's based on first, your soil health, uh, excuse me, the seed and ratio. If your seed and ratio is balanced like this example, then it's based on your demand, uh, which is your respiration. Grasses fix and provide more carbon. Legumes provide more nitrogen. If we have a high demand, like we do in this case at 203 uh, respiration, we want to make sure we've got enough grasses in the system in that cover crop mix. We do not provide you a list of species because that is dependent on way too many variables. Um, and there are better sources out there to, if for those of you doing cover crops, uh, to look at. 
green cover seed and I'm not affiliated with them, but I do not know a single person on the planet that knows more about cover crops than Keith Burns um, and, and his brother, Brian, and they have a wonderful calculator out there to help you design mixes. Uh, so it's just, it's a good tool. Um, so jumping ahead here to phosphorus, most soil tests give you one phosphorus number. This one's gonna give you six. So we have on the left-hand side, total extractable phosphorus. And the extract we're using in this case is H3A, which is just a fancy acronym for the four people that, that worked on it, Haney, Haney, Harmel, and Arnold. Um, it's an extract designed to mimic soil solution. It's weak organic acids. Uh, and I see we have a question here, I'll address in one second, that we've got, a weak organic acid that essentially is extracting and pulling these nutrients out of the soil. So we have total phosphorus. That includes all soluble forms of phosphorus. Right next to that, we have inorganic phosphorus or phosphate. Now, this is the one that's available to the crop. So it's soluble and it's available. It's in the right form. The difference between those two is organic phosphorus, and that's all other phosphorus that's soluble, but it's not in the phosphate form. Microbes can access this one readily. They can see it. And so then based on how many microbes you have, we're going to give you a release value, organic phosphorus release or REL. And then there's a reserve. So what is left? Now, You'll notice the release in this example is maxed out at what we measured. We don't give you a release higher than what we measure. Okay. The second piece is, is that the available, uh, or sorry, the reserve is zero. Well, that's okay. Um, remember, this is a continuum. So this is what is soluble. So as this continuum rolls, Microbes continue to work, plants continue to break down, manure that you apply, whatever it may be, phosphorus fertilizer, it continues to cycle and break down. So the reserve at zero is just saying, you've maxed out this credit for this soil sample this time. And as that reserve gets replenished, we start the cycle over again, okay? And then finally, we have the available, the available P. Um, so, Okay, that question, uh, the question from Leland. Uh, Leland, I will address that question, but I'm gonna wait uh, just a little while to do that uh, because that's, it's a good question, but I'm gonna wait just a minute to jump into that when I start talking about nitrogen. Uh, the rest of the fertility numbers down here below, potassium, calcium, mag, sodium, zinc, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these are run using the same instrumentation as before. Uh, on conventional tests, no, no difference here. Um, the big difference you'll notice is that if you're comparing these numbers to other traditional extracts, uh, conventional extracts, ammonium acetate, malic 3, these numbers look very different. Uh, part of the issue is, again, you're trying to evaluate what is available. The idea behind H3A is that you're using chemistry in the lab to try to mimic chemistry that takes place in the soil, in the field. If we use different extracts, whether it's water all the way to concentrated sulfuric acid, you get different numbers based on the strength of that extract, okay? So when you put an extract in the soil, think of it as a tug of war. The soil is gonna try to hold on to what it's got and the extract is trying to yank it away from the soil and put it into solution. The stronger the extract or the more acidic, the stronger that is and the more, the higher these numbers become typically. Uh, but does that really evaluate what your plant has access to? That's the big argument, right? That's the big question. Uh, again, we run conventional soil tests. Uh, we use Malik 3, we have all those things, but we find that when we're talking about a regenerative model, that's driven mostly by biology rather than just straight chemistry, these types of extracts tend to line up and work better. So here's the nitrogen piece. 
there are nine numbers on here for nitrogen. Uh, if you get east of the Mississippi River, they don't even measure nitrogen. It's a it's it's pKPH. That's your standard soil test. Uh, they just assume that if you don't use the nitrogen, that you no longer have it. In this scenario, we still include nitrate. That's the first number. So this is your comparison to a conventional test. Then we have ammonium. We add those two numbers together. This is your plant available nitrogen. This is in parts per million, 21.7. We're also going to do a water extract and look just like phosphorus. We're going to measure all soluble nitrogen in the system. So that includes nitrate, it includes ammonium. That's your total nitrogen in this case. Now again, different between the total digest, total extractable nitrogen using water. That's the difference. So this is like saying, okay, I'm gonna, you know, think of nitrate as your check, your primary checking account, ammonium as your secondary checking account. And then you've got total nitrogen is like, oh, this is my retirement account. This is the cash on my desk. This is the change in my sofa. And, it, and it's also the checking, you know, the checking account. So if we subtract out the nitrate and ammonium, we are left with organic in. And the organic in again is available to the microbes. It's tied to carbon, but it's not yet available to the plant. The organic nitrogen to inorganic nitrogen ratio, that is just showing you, you know, systems that are being driven biologically uh, through microbes tend to have a higher percentage of organic nitrogen than inorganic. Now that can vary a little bit depending on timing of fertilizer applications, but systems that are being driven chemically uh, tend to have really high or inorganic nitrogen and very low organic because they're just not being driven. Um, so that's just an indicator. Uh, again, we have the release and we have the reserve. Uh, works the same way as, as phosphorus. Uh, and then we have available nitrogen in pounds per acre based on depth of test. So the nitrogen comparison piece down below here shows you what your nitrogen credit would be just looking at nitrate. And again, I said this was an eight inch sample depth. So we take 18.5 times eight times 0.3, and that's the standard kind of calculation to get pounds per acre for nitrogen. And we get 44. On the Haney test, we mentioned we had nitrate plus ammonium plus the organic nitrogen release as credits. And that's a total credit of 122 pounds and a difference if you do that, it's about 78 pounds difference. And depending on what you're paying for nitrogen fertilizer, that's your nitrogen savings on a per acre basis. If you take the full credits from the Haney test, that is your savings. So when we do this, and I'm gonna focus on nitrogen, but it works the same way. Um, I often get told, well, you can't do this because it's not, you know, quote unquote calibrated or, you know, it's a bunch of mumbo jumbo and it's different, et cetera. And I said, well, okay, well, let's actually compare what we're doing. Conventional method for making recommendations versus the regen method. And I don't mean regen, I, I say regen because this is how we do it at the lab. Um, but this is the same idea, crop, you're gonna tell me the crop to grow and what your yield goal is. Based on that, we determine the total amount of nutrient required. So depending on who you ask, if you're growing corn, they'll say one pound of nitrogen per bushel or 1.2 or 1.1 or whatever it is, um, you're using that to determine the amount needed. Now you get the credits from your soil test. On the conventional side, you get nitrate. On this side, you get nitrate plus ammonium plus organic nitrogen release. You have a pass crop, crev crop, et cetera, credits from subsoil. So the question here, um, Leland talked about zero, he tests zero to six, six to 12, 12 to 24 uh, for ammonium and nitrate. And at the time of sampling, uh, just talking about fungi and bacteria, influence available plant nitrogen. Uh, what level does soil moisture drive the numbers? And if it doesn't, what is the major driver? Uh, so Leland, soil moisture and temperature are your major drivers. Uh, we have to have moisture to convert organic nitrogen into ammonium, and then ammonium gets converted into nitrate if oxygen is present. So we need moisture, 
Too much moisture, if it stays too wet and your soils are waterlogged, uh, they go anaerobic and we end up building ammonium in the system. As soon as it goes uh, oxygenated or aerobic again, it converts to nitrate. Um, the fungi do a lot of the transport. Uh, the bacteria do a lot of the conversion. And so uh, they kind of work together. We don't recommend running a Haney test, you know, beyond 12 inches. Uh, so in this type of scenario, when I talk about subsoil credits, typically we do like a zero to six Haney, maybe a six to 12 Haney. Uh, and then after that, it's, it's nitrate and sulfate, um, you know, and ammonium, you can do ammonium. So we do those, you know, from 12 to 24 or 12 to 36 or whatever it may be. Those are still credits and that's where they come in here on that subsoil credit part. Um, Moisture, like I said, moisture is a major driving factor. We got to be cautious of it, careful with it, um, but just mostly be mindful of it. Uh, if, if you're in a straight drought and, and you have been for six months, you know, we don't expect a lot of microbial activity. But then again, nitrogen's not your limiting factor in that situation. It's moisture. Uh, so you can put on all the fertilizer you want and you're not going to grow a crop if, if it's that dry. Uh, so typically, if your crops are drought stressed, your microbes are drought stressed. Uh, if your crops are not drought stressed, neither are your microbes. Uh, we also do credits from irrigation water. Um, if, you're, if you're irrigating, you can add that in. Uh, notice that, and I know on the conventional side, sometimes they do a credit for organic matter. But again, I mentioned before, if you're taking nitrogen out of the organic matter, you're destroying the organic matter. And that typically is not a goal of most, uh, almost every producer I've ever talked to. So let's put some real numbers to this. I'm gonna grab these numbers that we talked about before, okay? I'm gonna go back to this soil health and why are we maximizing that release? Well, respiration is high, the seed in ratio is balanced. That leads to the maximum nitrogen release and overall nutrient cycling. You've got a lot of workers, they're being paid well, they're happy with the benefits program, everything's great. If we got moisture and it's not blizzarding outside, the microbes are gonna do their job. They're gonna come to work and they're gonna get, get after it. And as a producer, we want the, the return from that. So let's put numbers to this fertility rec. There's one piece, I'm gonna step back really, 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 really quickly. Um, maybe, if I can, okay. So this credit from past crop or cover crop test, either one. So if you do a past crop, you know, if it's soybeans, for example, we do a 40 pound credit for soybeans. And I know, again, we can argue all day long. Is that not enough, too much, et cetera. We put the credits directly on the report. So if you don't like that credit, add it back in to your recommendation. But there's one piece to cover crop test, and this is Brown Ranch uh, in Bismarck. Uh, stole this from Gabe years ago, this picture. Um, but the cover crop test, everyone says, well, I got this cover crop. How do I evaluate what's actually in it? And Anthony, I am long-winded today. I apologize. So I'm going to keep rolling, but stop me when you need to. Go ahead. You, you, it's about uh, 1046 right now. Okay. 48, um, 48, 10, 48. All right, we'll keep rolling. So a lot of people evaluate cover crops. They, they, they drive down past the field. I always joke around. I, you know, they'll drive past the field at 50, 55 miles an hour. They'll let off the gas and coast, cover their good eye, and then look out at the cover crop and say, well, it's pretty tall. It's pretty thick or oh, it's pretty sparse. I you know, think we got 40 pounds of nitrogen in that cover crop. Uh, we got 10 pounds of phosphorus, whatever it may be. Um, this test is going to tell you what you have in the above ground portion, okay? So you can run this test, you clip off all the above ground material in a given area. In this example, it's a three foot by three foot square. It does not have to be. If you are growing cover crops six feet tall and they are thick, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to ship a dump truck worth of, of material to the lab, but we need to know the area. So you can do a one foot by one foot. You can do that three separate places and combine it all together. And now, you know, like a composite soil sample. Um, but you tell us the area, we get a wet weight, we dry it, 
We get a dry weight to calculate moisture. From that, knowing the area sample, excuse me, we can tell you how many tons of dry matter per acre you have in that cover crop. And in this example, 5.3 tons. Then we analyze for all the things on the left-hand side, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, et cetera. Looks very similar to a total nutrient digest because it is. After we determine the, the dry matter, it's about the same. So we analyze that and then we give you pounds per acre of nutrient based on the dry matter. So in this cover crop example, there were 4,600 pounds of carbon, 164 pounds of nitrogen, almost 60 pounds of phosphorus, 312 pounds of potassium tied up in that cover crop biomass. And that biomass had a C to N ratio of 27, or excuse me, 28 to one, 27.9 to one, okay? So this is what you potentially have locked up in this vault temporarily. The question then is always, well, when am I gonna get it back? Now we have the Haney test data. We know that the microbial, we know what the microbial respiration is. We know the CDN ratio of this cover crop. Uh, if you can tell me as a producer, if you're irrigating, where you're located, what's your climate been like, we can start to guesstimate, yes, it's a guess, how much of this is going to be available. And you can be as aggressive or as conservative as you want to be. Some people tell me this isn't aggressive enough because it doesn't account for the roots. You're right. We don't extrapolate to the roots because nobody wants to dig them all up. And even if we tried, we wouldn't get them all. So this is just the above ground portion. So if I step back to this example, how do we, excuse me, how do we apply this? So I've got corn here at 200 bushel yield goal. We use, we meaning the lab, we use a value of 1.1 pounds of nitrogen per bush. So if I'm just looking at nitrogen again, 220 pounds of nitrogen required. The credits on the conventional side, 44 pounds. The credits on this other side, 44 pounds for nitrate, about eight pounds of ammonium, close to 70 pounds uh, from the organic fraction. And remember the cover crop test said 164 pounds of nitrogen I'm personally giving credit between 80 and 120 pounds for that test. Uh, knowing all of the pieces I know, if somebody asked me, that's what I would tell them. So if we put that together, your fertilizer recommendation on the conventional side is 175 units and on the other side it's zero. Now, here's the disclaimer. I literally just pulled, when I put this together, I just pulled samples from a field that I knew the management history of, and I also knew that we had all of these pieces so I could put them together. It just show, just happens that the recommendation at this goal I put in here, and this is not the farmer's goal, by the way, but my goal I put in here at 200 bushel corn, the recommendation is zero. On average, Without the cover crop test factored in, on average, the Haney test gives you 20 pounds additional credit. That's the average. Gabe is pushing 140. Russell Hedrick in North Carolina is at 80. Uh, Rick Clark in Indiana is at 50. Um, but the average is 20 based on a quarter million soil samples. Uh, so it's not, all, again, the message is not to say, don't put any nitrogen on. It just so happens in this example, that's what the recommendation would be. So questions on that. I got just a couple other slides um, about how, so why does this work and how does it work? Uh, and, and what it really boils down to is the distribution and transport team. Those are the organisms. So I think we all remember something that happened or is currently happening. It was called COVID or maybe never happened depending on your, your take on it. But regardless, the world shut down. And store shelves were empty if they were open, uh, restaurants were closed, et cetera, et cetera. And they, they a lot of times said, well, it's because we don't have anything to put on the shelves. Okay, so is it a manufacturing problem? 
Well, one night I'm laying in bed and I'm frustrated because we're ordering equipment. We're ordering things for a lab, trying to get going. And I can't get anything delivered. I can't get anybody to show up. I can't, I mean, we're just stuck in the water and I'm frustrated with it. So I got to thinking, you know, there's all these ships in the Harbor. They were lined up out of San Diego, transport ships, um, container ships. And you got all these empty store shelves. But the distribution and transport teams, the dock loaders, the truck drivers, the, the people stocking the shelves, they weren't allowed to go to work. They couldn't get in there. Nobody could load anything. Distribution shut down. And in soil testing, we are very good in ag. We're very good at evaluating the warehouse, which is the soil. We look at the warehouse. And we look at the fertility, we look at all the stuff on the shelves, right? Here's the nitrogen on the shelf, phosphorus, potassium. We're very good at evaluating what the retail side is, which is yield. So we're, we can measure yield. But if the yield is not what we expect based on what's in the warehouse, what do we do? Well, we go back and reevaluate the warehouse and we say, well, you know, we need to add more into the warehouse. We need more phosphorus, more nitrogen or a balance here, right? We got to balance all these ratios and we got to do all this. Nobody ever says, well, what about the transport team? How do we get it from the warehouse to the factory? How do we get the nitrogen from point A into point B so we can actually produce something by, it? you know, our yield monitors tell us what the output of the factory is but we need to know what's getting to the crop. And there's other things in there, plant sap analysis, plant tissue analysis, that's evaluating the factory. So that's the guy at the loading dock with the clipboard saying, yep, we got this, we got that. Yep, yep, no, no, we're short of this. Um, it's not coming from the warehouse. So how does it get there? It's these guys, bacteria, actinomyces, fungi, algae, protozoans, nematodes. And most of them on this list are good. So when we think of nematodes, we often think bad. Most nematodes are good. Most protozoans are good. But when things get out of balance, they become bad. And then we end up trying to fight them. So this process works this way. This is the other half of the cycle that we don't really think about. Plants capture carbon dioxide. They're going to produce one of two things. Complex carbon compounds. These are things we see. Uh, this is your corn yield, this is your leaves, this is your stems, roots. They also produce simple carbon compounds. These are the root exudates. So the root exudates, I'll tell you that up to about 40% of all the carbon captured by the crop is lost to the soil on purpose through the roots. And it's feeding into this microbial factory. Fungi and actinomyces attack complex carbon compounds. Bacteria tend to attack simple carbon compounds. And that causes a lot of carbon to be effluxed back into the soil or back into the atmosphere from the soil. In the world of carbon, everyone says, oh my gosh, that's terrible. We don't want carbon leaving the system. And I said, yeah, I also wish that every dollar I got paid, I never had to spend. But if we all did that, the economy would shut down and we'd all just stand around because that's not how economy works. You have to spend it in order to save it in some way. It sounds really weird, right? But it takes money to make money, right? It takes carbon to store carbon. The microbes have to do their job. And the more we feed them, the more they can put into number four, which is your start uh, stable carbon pool. It's mostly made up of decomposed, partly decomposed plant material, dead microbes, and what they call extracellular metabolites, leftover stuff. Okay. So Lance, we just have two minutes left. Okay. Um, um, did you answer that question from Leland Shun? I tried. I tried to get into it a little bit on the, the uh, nitrate and ammonium. Um, so, you know, he's already doing, Leland's already doing the nitrate plus ammonium, which is fantastic. Most people are just looking at nitrate. Um, and he said, yeah, he said, good answer. Good yeah. answer. Okay. Wanted to make sure of that before our time ran out here. And, uh, cause I know Lance, you got to get to yep. another meeting, correct? Yep. So okay. I just want to zip through these last couple really fast here. Okay. 
Good. Um, microbes are doing their work with enzymes. Uh, they're breaking them down and these are the enzymes being used. So how do we evaluate who the players are in this game? And this is what this test is. This is the B crop test from Biomakers. Um, it is a metagenomic analysis. It is like PLFA on steroids. Okay, it's gonna look at all of the microbes in the system. It dumps everybody into a hat and then they evaluate the organisms based on different functions. Here's the part I really want to show you. It's this piece right here. Organisms are responsible for different nutrient pathways. Different organisms, just like different people, have different skill sets. So we've got, you want to build a house, you've got plumbers and, and carpenters and concrete people and electricians. Different organisms are good at doing different things. So when we evaluate the transport team, I want to know... Do we have microbes that are going to fix carbon? Do we have microbes that are going to move or supply nitrogen, whether that's fixing nitrogen or moving it? Do we have phosphorus pathways that are open or closed? Because that's how we can evaluate if the system is going to deliver these nutrients. And they also do this for the minor compounds, zinc, iron, manganese, et cetera. So that's what really is interesting is about understanding the, the house. And I'm not gonna talk about that last slide. Um, the house or, or what we've got in the system versus what's getting into the plant. And it's not always apply more. Uh, in some cases we do need to apply more, but evaluating that and all together, we end up with this message right here. Improving these biological functions it's not just for the environment. It's not just for the kumbaya part um, or, you know, everyone likes nutrient density, talks about that, which we can't even define yet. And that's important. But at the end of the day, your bottom line, you as a producer have to make decisions. And the only thing you really have control over, I'm sorry to say this, is that it's the checks you choose to sign. And when you purchase that fertilizer, if you don't get your expected result, the fertilizer company does not refund you. Uh, so it, it can be a big risk up front, especially as the prices continue to go up. So this is kind of the take home piece here. And then this is my contact information. If anybody um, has any, any questions. Uh,